What do you do to rest after work? Sleep. Not having to do anything. But in reality, I don't really get to sleep that much. I talk about it more than I actually do. Some days are quite simple. I just go home, have dinner with my wife, and watch TV. Um, other days, I go to my 242 group. Um, and then one day a week as well, I always play sports with my friends as well. When I get home from work, I am normally the one who cooks and I enjoy it. My wife used to do cooking for us in the UK. For her, it would have been a chore, uh, but I use it as a way of relaxing. But I cheat because I put headphones on and watch a series or watch sport or something like that on my tablet. Welcome, everybody. Oh. <laughs> See, you're probably confused. Youth takeover and you're looking at this face. <laughs> That's your problem. You need to understand there's a 15-year-old inside of me. I'm forever trying to keep him suppressed, but he keeps bursting out once in a while. And uh, one day I'll grow up, but I don't think so. Because you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're like a child. Guys, isn't it, isn't it, wasn't that so encouraging to see the youth and the girls lead us uh, as hosts? Wonderful. Girl. So encouraging. So encouraging. If you're here for the first time or you're a regular member here in the hall, online and platinum, a warm welcome to you. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to uh, tomorrow night, Monday night, 7 p.m. at level five. We've got uh, movement Day mobilisation. And what Movement Day is, and that'll be happening on May the 4th next year, March the 4th next year, March the 4th. But, but tomorrow night, it's mobilisation for Movement Day. And Movement Day really is a platform in which Christians get together in different spheres. There's one sphere is pastors, others are those in the workforce, others are NGOs wanting to make a difference, and all of us seeking to make a difference in the city of Dubai. Our vision of Movement Day is to serve the city by loving the city that we may reach the city for Jesus Christ. And I'd uh, love you to be a part of it. Uh, you're most welcome to come. Just let us know. Uh, it's going to be a great opportunity as we think how we can be salt and light. I heard yesterday this kind of interesting piece of this fact, that is, Dallas, Texas, is the city with the biggest amount of megachurches, but it also has the most strip joints. There's a problem there, isn't there? Why is it that the, obviously, growth in the church hasn't translated into impacting the city sufficiently? Now, it's not for me to comment on that city, but our responsibility is our city, and we want to make sure that we're not just simply growing as a church and adding another site, which is fantastic, but actually we're making a difference of salt and light, seeing the city of Dubai transformed for its good and uh, God's glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to be looking at work and rest today particularly rest. Uh, every culture thinks differently about work and rest. I think of my Pacific Island friends uh, from Samoa and uh, Tonga and Fiji. And it seems to me, of all the cultures I've ever met, they seem to get it right. Work hard, rest well is how they do it. I'm from Maltese migrant culture. We're just downright workaholics and proud of it to our shame. So you can tell a Maltese migrant that he's an adulterer or a liar, no problem, just don't call me lazy. That would be the biggest problem. It's, it was, it's more shameful to be called lazy than, than a liar, uh, which kind of tells you there's something wrong with us. Um, we don't get the work-rest rhythm right that's in the Bible. Now, from the work surveys that we asked of you to tell us about your day off, we found that less than 60% have a regular rest day. Um, so it's good that there's that many who do, but there's over 40% that don't for various reasons. And I understand sometimes it's because there's external pressure. You, you know, your boss, your, your, your company, whatever, is not doing the right thing and not giving you a break or not paying you sufficiently to have a break. For others, the pressure is actually internal, that you can't let it go. You're constantly in work mode and you can't be kind of in the rest zone in any way, either because you're feeling guilty or who knows what. Today, hopefully, you'll get a grasp that in God's plan, the work rest rhythm is how he wants you to live, to think as you glorify God. 
So let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say. Genesis 2.2, let's go to the beginning. And we read there, by the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work, from the work of creation of bringing nothing into something, God rested, not because he was exhausted like those last million stars really took it out of him. That was exhausting. No, he rested because the job was done. The work of creation had finished. His work of providence of sustaining the universe, that kept going on. But here the job was done. Now you notice when you read Genesis chapter 2 that that the seventh day doesn't end. There's no morning, there was evening, the seventh day. It stays open. Why? Because God wanted us to enter into that rest and all the blessings that God had for us. In a sense, even when Adam was to work, he was still working in the context of the rest of the Garden of Eden. But of course, uh, as you know, uh, we were evicted from the Garden because of our sin And sin had spoiled God's plan to bring rest. So what you see after Genesis 1 and 2 is sneak previews of God's great plan to bring you to a point of rest. You know, that's one of God's great goal for that to happen. And one of the great sneak previews, of course, is the Sabbath commandment given to Israel at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. It's the fourth of the the Ten Commandments. God says to his people who are now saved and rescued, remember the Sabbath, rest day, by keeping it holy, set apart. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, rest to the Lord your God. So here is a command to both work and to rest. Now, the focus on this command, though, is to make sure you're resting. Um, That work-rest rhythm You see it kind of built into creation, but it's actually built into the covenant with Israel. And the rhythm of work and rest is to mark God's people as holy, set apart from all the other nations that you can be guaranteed weren't resting. Why? Because the God of Israel was a God different from the God of other nations. Amen? And it showed the goodness of God. I mean, seriously, God... God, uh, it it was not just for Israel to enjoy. This commandment wasn't just for the people of Israel to enjoy. If you were a foreigner living in Israel, you get to enjoy it as well. It wasn't just for the rich, it was for the poor. It wasn't just for the free, it was for the slaves. Um, It wasn't even just for humans, it was for animals. Every animal had to rest as well. It wasn't even just for the animals. The land itself every seven years had to rest and uh, lay fallow so that it could rejuvenate. And it was a time to refresh. Why? Because as we know, even our smartphones need to be recharged. How's it going? No, it's, it's nearly dead. <laughs> How much more human beings? It allowed God's people to steward their bodies properly, their relationships, their land, their animals. Uh, it was given... Uh, Uh, so that God's people could stop and not only be refreshed, but enjoy and taste that the Lord is good. And it was a time to trust God. Because whenever Israel dropped tools, especially in harvest time, it was saying, God, you're in charge and you are the great provider. Now, remember, Israel had just come off the back of being enslaved for not weeks, months and years, but for decades, for centuries, they were enslaved to the Egyptians. And uh, if you reckon you've got bad working conditions, try those. And they, their working conditions as slaves in Egypt was going from bad to worse. And in that context, they get to hear that God has heard the cries of his people, has kept his promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and said, my heart is moved to compassion. I want my people to be set free to worship me. And then what does worship look like? i tell you what it looks like. God says, I want you to work six days and on the seventh, I want you to rest. What a good God is that? No other God of the, all the other... Please try again. <laughs> now that's often it's doing that. It's possessed. <laughs> I like it when it says, uh, I don't understand. I thought, you're speaking on behalf of the congregation. <laughs> 
we kind of take it for granted. Cultures have been shaped in any way by the Bible. Take the idea of a regular rest day for granted. I was in Thailand uh, years ago and there was a tailor. And I noticed every day he was at his, uh, in his shop and I said, Bimal, that was his name, which is your day off? Which is your rest day? He said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, like what day off do you have each week? He said, we don't have days off. There are two public holidays in Thailand and unless you work for the government or unless you work for a company high up, uh, you're expected to work. I said, you're kidding. What, 360, what, three days a year? Yep. And then I thought, I said, Bimal, I'm a follower of Jesus and uh, the God of the Bible directs us to not only work but to rest weekly. Really? He says, yeah. I said, Bimal, the God of the Bible, he's a very good God, you know. He said, he is. <laughs> Who would have thought the fourth commandment was an opportunity to witness? But it made me realise the, the way in which the Bible had, had shaped certainly my culture back in Australia but certainly so many cultures now. Um, I told staff, uh, and, and I've got to say this, it's, if you are a boss, a manager, you own a company, a business, you make sure that your workers not only work, as you're required to do, but to actually make sure that they rest. That's on you to make sure that that is provided. We're not saying that there aren't crises where you've got to step in and work longer and harder some weeks. But, uh, I mean, I didn't have a day off this week. That was very unusual for me because I try to keep the, the rhythm going. But generally, that ought to be your rhythm. I was saying to the staff this two weeks ago, I said, it's very important you guard your day off, but also guard each other's day off as well as best you can. Not to be a legalist, but to aim for it. In the early days of our first church plant, um, I was just working long hours, no days off. And after about six months, I'm sitting on the lounge and my wife, she's never done this before or since, she sat at my feet, she put her hands on my lap, she looked up and with a very respectful but earnest tone in her voice said this, Ray, if it keeps on going on like this, it's not going to work. She had my attention. Now, to be honest, I don't know what she meant. Marriage wasn't going to work. The church plan wasn't going to work. <laughs> but I, it was a shot over the bow and she had my attention. <laughs> and I'm so thankful she spoke up. And can I say, spouses, you need to speak up. Do not be silent. Because some of us, she'd been saying that for years, even while we were studying at Bible college. I, I wasn't taking rest day. And, and it was damaging our marriage. It was damaging our family. And from that moment on, I finally got it into gear. And chances are, if I didn't, I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, refusal to heed, to not listen to the wisdom of God, that work-rest rhythm will damage you, it will damage your relationships and, uh, and that will not be honouring to God at all. Now the Sabbath commandment is also exercised with an idea to express our thankfulness for God's salvation. Look at Deuteronomy 5. Now remember Deuteronomy 5, God's people have been in the wilderness for 40 years. They're about to re-enter the promised land and God reissues the Ten Commandments here like he did in Exodus. Uh, but this time he gives a slightly different reason for the Sabbath commandment. Deuteronomy 5. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, for that reason, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Okay, God had built rest into the working week of the Israelite. Why? So he could build rest into their souls forevermore. That is to say, by resting each week, by entering into the work rest rhythm, you, you were basically saying, God was saying to you, I want you to keep your eye on heaven. I want you to keep your eye on the age to come. I want you to build into your week a structure that gets you looking forward to that day off so that you look forward to the age to come. What a good God. My day off's Friday. By Thursday night, I haven't done everything I needed to do, just like you. And I'm forever confronted with this urge to squeeze a little bit more time out of the weeks, that God, the days that God has given me. And then I have to tell myself, I have to entrust my labour, even as a pastor, to God. And that remember that it is His church, not mine. 
And it works exactly the same for you in your sphere of work. That it, your job is not your job, it's his job. It's his company, it's not your company, it's his business, it's not your business. And so we work on his terms so that when we drop tens, drop, uh, sorry, drop pens, drop tools, whatever you're dropping in your work, drop, drop the broom, whatever it is, one day a week, you're actually saying, I'm built for heaven. I'm not home yet. There's a salvation coming. And, and the day, the structuring of the work rest rhythm is to constantly feed my, make me hungry for heaven. So a word, if you're a perfectionist or married to one, let me encourage you. Let it go. I've got a bit of it in me. And it is really hard just to make sure that you spill in, that you don't keep spilling into your rest day and, uh, and find yourself in the end working seven days a week. It'll harm you. It'll harm your family. It'll harm the family of God. Okay. Now, when Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, the Jewish leaders had come up with 39 different categories of work that you weren't supposed to do. Uh, seriously, they took the fun out of the Sabbath, I'm pretty sure. Uh, because the principle was clear and Jesus said the Sabbath was made for, notice, humans, not for Israel. The Sabbath was made for man, humans, not the other way, not humans for the Sabbath. We weren't to be enslaved to the Sabbath rest. It was there to do us good. And it wasn't about doing nothing. Can I just say, gentlemen, especially if you're in your 20s, your goal is not to spend 10 hours on Xbox in your undies, in your underpants. That, that's not the picture of rest. Two hours would be fine. But uh, to spend the whole day that way, the, the aim is not to do nothing. That kind of misses the point. I always like what one rabbi said. If you work with your hands during the week, then work with your mind on your rest day. Uh, use your mind. If you use your uh, mind constantly during the week, then use your hands. Now, that's just a piece of wisdom from a rabbi, but I kind of, what he's saying is cease from what you normally do so you can be refreshed and do, by doing something else. Now, on the one hand, you weren't permitted to buy and sell on the Sabbath. And I think that was about guarding people in the retail. But you were permitted to offer sacrifice and worship to God. You were even allowed to enter into battle uh, in a time of crisis to uh, protect your family. Why? Because the Sabbath was there to do good. To that end, for those of you who are in those service industries that do require to operate 24-7, emergency services, hospital, nurses and whatever, and you're on shift work. In fact, anyone who's on shift work, the rest of us want to say we thank God for you because we think that is probably the hardest pattern of work because you're constantly out of line with everybody else. And the challenge for you is to try to work out how do I get into a work rest rhythm that's healthy? And that's what you've got to talk to each other about. I mean, that's what often happens, isn't it? A preacher will give you a principle, but I can't apply it into everyone's story, right? So that's the job of each of you to teach one another. You're talking to someone in the same sphere that you work in. Heed how someone else is doing. You think, you know, that's a good, I'm going to adopt that principle as we help each other become more like Christ. Now, the pressure to work seven days a week is there for most of us. And interestingly, Israel surrendered to that temptation and ended up working seven days a week. You know, in Egypt, she was forced as slaves to do that. But when she was given her freedom in the promised land, she enslaved herself by working seven days a week. And you know, one of the reasons why God evicted Israel out of the promised land was because she didn't keep the Sabbath. It's interesting. When Adam and Eve disobeyed, they missed out on the rest in the, in the Garden of Eden. When Israel disobeyed, so that was, sorry, when Adam and Eve disobeyed, they missed out on the rest in the Garden of Eden. When Israel disobeyed, they missed out on the rest in the Promised Land. So I wonder today, are you missing out on a rest? There's different kinds of rest, isn't there? You know, are you just physically tired, emotionally tired? You know, it's been a, a, a week of working long hours. Well, it's been like that for me. A, a, a year of long days, a lifetime of no rest, a time, a, a season of little sleep. Your body is tired, your, your mind is weary, your soul is weathered. 
But maybe it's for other reasons. There's a tide, it's because you're constantly there for others, but no one's there for you. Tired of trying to live up to everyone else's expectations. It's exhausting. Tired of hiding the shame, hating yourself for what you've become. Tired of realising that what you most fear about yourself, you've become. Jesus came, you know he didn't come for the healthy and the whole. He came for those of us who are broken, fractured, contrite, those who are weary, tired, exhausted, burdened, without hope, without Christ. And to that group, us, all of us, Jesus says these beautiful words. He never directs you to religion. He always directs you to himself. And this is what he says. In fact, why don't we say it together? In Matthew 11, some of the most beautiful words from the Lord Jesus, so personal, so relational, come to me, he says. And so let's step into the words of our Lord when he says together, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, with the coming of Christ, the Sabbath command was always a shadow. The reality was always Christ himself, wasn't it? And here the promise is, is that we've entered into the ultimate rest, the ultimate Sabbath rest. In that sense, it never stops. Um, through Christ's perfect work at the cross, through his blood, his sweat, his tears. He who knew no sin became sin, my sin, your sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that now every failure fully paid, forever removed. Let me say that again. Every failure of ours fully paid for at the cross and forever removed never to shame us again. It's a rest we get to enjoy now, 24-7. You know, Hebrews 4.3 puts it this way. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God said. You get to rest in peace before you ever get to the grave. We don't have to wait to the grave before they, they stamp it on your gravestone. Rest in peace. You ought to be resting in peace right now. Living and active. It's the rest of knowing I'm forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm sealed by the Spirit of God. Fantastic. I'm in God's forever family. The rest of uh, knowing that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And as far as God is concerned, punishment is off the agenda when it comes to you and him. Amen? Amen. Oh, yeah. That's a good rest. That's a deep rest. And this is a rest that comes from within. This is a rest that is deep. Uh, And it means then now when I work, I work from the vantage point of that rest. I don't have to play the game that the rest of Dubai is playing, where they're trying to prove their identity and their worth by how successful they are at work. Now, sure, work is meaningful. We've seen that over the weeks, haven't we? You know, that's why one out of every 20 proverbs speaks against laziness. (laughs) Okay, it's a big deal. Work those days that God requires of you. Don't be lazy. But because work is not the meaning of life, I don't have to play the game of finding my identity in my job, nor do I have to see people in terms of their identity in terms of their job. So whether I'm dealing with a cleaner or a cardiologist, it's exactly the same. Is your identity in Christ or isn't it? That's the most important question. There was two seasons where my wife was sick for extended periods of time, about 18 months. And I remember the first time in the early years of me being a pastor, and I thought, wow, Sandy's just not, she had chron- chronic fatigue. She's not getting better. And we had kids and I, and I realised the kind of work we were involved in, it didn't allow me the ability to take care of her. And I, and I thought I might have to resign. So before I had the conversation with her, I thought to myself, can I resign? Why am I finding it so hard to resign? How quickly did my identity move from being a child of God to being a pastor? I thought, gee, that didn't take long. I stopped rejoicing in being a child of God and I was more thinking of myself as a pastor. I needed to get back to my true identity, which is your true identity, that we are children of God. It doesn't get any better than that. Being a pastor gives me about an extra 2% joy. (laughs) 98% of my joy is found in being a child of God. 
And so eventually I was able to get to that point where I could say to Sandy, Sandy, I'm, I'm happy to walk away. I'm not going to walk away from Jesus. I'm not going to walk away from being a fully committed member of his church, but I can walk away. I'm free to walk away from, being, from my particular role in church as a pastor. And I tell you, for those of you whose identity is in your job, you work from a very different place once you come to that point. I can walk away and it's going to be okay. I really, I tell you, I was so thankful for the process. As it turned out, Sandy's health improved. I didn't need to walk away. And here we are today. Now, Colossians 2 says, do not judge other people by how they do their work rest rhythm. Eh? Uh, we're all different and we've all got different ways of doing it. I'm talking about the principle of work rest rhythm, especially as new covenant believers. But here are some reflections I thought might be helpful for you. Um, try to learn to find rest in each day and each working week as a general principle. Find time and space each day where you cease from your labour for a period of time, put away your smartphone, woo, in another room is what I suggest, way, way away. That sucker will enslave you every time. It certainly does me. And breathe in God's word so that you can breathe out God's prayers. We've talked about that before. It's really just quietening your life for a moment during the day. And I want to say, find spots in the day to do that, to be still and know that God is God, to know that he's in charge and that he's for you. Very important to still your soul. Too many distract you can't. That, that smartphone will ruin your rest in Christ. It doesn't take it away. It just corrupts it all the time because we're always, always on cortisol, stimulation. It's called positive stimulation and it, and it really gets in the way of your mental health and your spiritual health. And so tell, it was Jim Packer who, uh, he wrote a great book called Knowing God and in it he talks about how every day he recites these six truths to himself and I'd like us to take these. You can photograph them. They're on the screen now coming up. Here are six things which he, he reminded himself every day of. And, you know, this is where you find rest as you learn to preach to yourself. Why don't we say them together? Together. I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My saviour is my brother. Every Christian is part of my forever family. Slow it up. You know, there's reactive, proactive praying where you set time aside and then there's reactive praying where you kind of pray through your day. Prayer needs to be like breathing, doesn't it? Where I'm constantly mindful of God as I'm wrestling with issues and I think, I don't know the answer to this, Lord, please help I'm hurting, I'm confused, I'm thankful, whatever. And then find, you know, if you, can, if you can find a moment as you transition from work to home, you know, we move very quickly now and maybe on a metro, a bus, in your car, just a 10-minute walk between one spot to another and uh, take time. I remember one guy uh, hearing the story of how he used to pull over on the side of the road. I wouldn't suggest this if you're on Sheikh Zayed Road, by the way, but... But he would pull over on the side of the road before he got home after a busy day at work and he'd open up his Bible and there'd be a particular verse he'd hone in on. It was Ephesians 4.29 and it says, Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is for the building up of others, that it may benefit them in their time of need. And he wanted to, when he left work, enter into the, the door, into his family, not wanting them to minister to him, but with him being mindful of being there for them. But that couldn't happen unless he just gave himself a moment of rest where he could think about God's thoughts before he entered into that home where he could actually bless them. Just look at Jesus. I mean, seriously, the crowds were pressing in on him with every possible need. I mean, when you can heal anything and anyone in the moment and there is a broken world out there, you bring those two together and Jesus, they're pursuing him, they're hunting him down. And then we read in Luke 5, verse 16, I love this verse. It says this, 
Luke 5, verse 16. If you could just have it on the screen, please. It's coming. But Jesus withdrew. Oh, often withdrew to lonely places and prayed to be with his Father in heaven. Often withdrew. There was all this pressing need. It was so busy. There's only one Saviour, right? <laughs> no, I need to know. Because he, he became human flesh that was frail. He still needed to withdraw. He, he still needed his time with his Father in heaven. And he often did it. It's not like he did it once every six months. <laughs> and he works, it's not like he didn't work hard. He worked so hard. You know he worked hard because he's found asleep on a boat in the middle of a storm. <laughs> now, my brother, he's a deep sleeper. You can't wake that, you can't wake him up. He's just such a deep sleeper. But, but Jesus was so exhausted from all that ministry, he's found asleep on a boat in a storm. And I want to say, God has given not only work as a gift, he's given sleep as a gift. I find this amazing, that God wants you to glorify him one third of every day by doing absolutely nothing, except maybe snoring. <laughs> that we get to snore to the glory of God. It's amazing, isn't it? He built us in such a way that a third of our day, if you manage to reach about eight hours, and I was talking to someone at the pre uh, previous service, and they said, before I was married, I used to sleep for 10 hours. After I got married and had kids, I now am working on five to seven hours. But either way, sleep. A third of your day, God wants you to do absolutely nothing. And I want you to think theologically about your sleep. It is a reminder that every time you sleep, embrace it. Embrace it. It's a declaration where you're saying to God, I can sleep now because I am mortal and I am fragile and I need to, you know, and I need to be refreshed. I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not a machine. I need God built me this way. Embrace sleep as a declaration. God, you are in charge and I need to be recharged. <laughs> And then Jesus comes along. And what does he do? When he rises from the dead, he turns death into sleep. You know, in the Bible, death is often referred to as sleep, but that's only because of the resurrection. Every time you sleep, it's interesting. It's an act of faith. You think about it. You go to bed, you close your eyes on the trust that you're going to wake, the, wake up seven, eight hours later. And you wake up and it's true. You may not be consciously trusting God, but you should consciously trust God. I'm entrusting now my sleep to you, to the glory of God. And every time you sleep, it's kind of a dress rehearsal for that final sleep where you close your eyes in this age and you wake up in the age to come. You don't know time has passed. You've moved from one zone to another, from this age to the age to come. So think of your sleep every day as a dress rehearsal for that final sleep. Good idea? <laughs> Psalm 127 verse 2. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Pastor Barak said this last week. I loved it. He said, God can do more in our sleep than we can in our work. Isn't that a good line? God can do more in our sleep than we can in our work. Friends, as we think about that, I want, you to, I want you to keep thinking of the principle, work hard, rest well. That's really what I've essentially been saying. And as we do that, I want, you to, I want you to understand that we're all different in how we rest. That is to say, we're all different. I'm an introvert, which means I get my, I'm a mild introvert, which means I need a part of the week where I'm by myself. Otherwise, I'll get sick. My wife's an, an extrovert. She gets her energy from being with people. I like being with people, but there's a, because I'm a mild introvert, I need to retreat for a period of time. And you need to know yourself. So I'm a morning person who's an introvert who loves movies. Sandy is an extrovert who's a night person who likes gardening. Very different people. <laughs> and you've got to learn to know how to rest together. I love what my son, I mean, you, you, especially those uh, of us with spouses who are uh, perhaps working at home all the time, that when, you know, I had a friend of mine and uh, his wife was a homeschooler, they were homeschoolers, 
And so every Saturday morning, he would make sure he'd be with the kids all morning so that his wife could be with her friends and spend time with the Lord. That is to say, he was guarding the rest time, not only for himself, but actually for his spouse. And you need to actively think, I not only need to nurture that within me, but the others in my family. And then we need to learn how to rest together as a church family. Every time you come here, you've already said no to so many other things. Why? So that you can be with God's people, rest in God's truth that he, that he is for you, sing to him praises, thank God for him, and remember, encourage each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Because rest is not about doing nothing. It's about doing good. And as we align, every time you say no to something to be here, you're saying yes to people here and saying, I want to be here for you. By my very presence, as I join in the singing, as I encourage words, have words of encouragement afterwards. But I do want to end with this principle, and it's this. Remember, rest comes from the inside because Christ is in us and that's where our rest is found. Uh, I had a, uh, a picture in my office for many years. And it was of a, I remember when I first saw it, I wanted it for, my, for, for Christmas, and I got it. It was way back in 1997. And it's of a lighthouse that just rises up from the sea off the coast of France. And, uh, and there's like, uh, you know, these 10 metre waves thrashing the lighthouse. You can see it there. And the moment I saw it, I loved it because I thought, wow, look at that lighthouse. It must have been there for 50 years. And no matter what waves and wind was hammered against it, it it stood tall and strong and steadfast. I thought, I want to be like that as a picture, you know, a vision. But that's not the reason why I wanted it. The reason why I wanted it is you can see a third of the way up, there's a doorway, and in the doorway there's a man. I said, yeah, that's right. You're not the, you're not the lighthouse, Ray. You're the man protected in the lighthouse. God is the lighthouse, the God whose great purposes can't be stopped, who will protect us, who nothing will snatch us from his hand. He's the lighthouse. I'm the dude in the lighthouse. Yeah. And no matter what comes our way. But that's not the reason why I want it. <laughs> the reason why I want it is you look very carefully. You can see where's the man's hand? It's in his pocket. Now, when a, when a dude has his hand in his pocket, I mean, he might be looking cool, but what he's really doing is saying, I'm relaxed. I'm at peace. Look at those waves. They're just thrashing that lighthouse but his hand's in his pocket. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Friends, that's the posture God wants you to have because you're in Christ. Come to me, all of you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. rest. And you need to ask God to allow that rest to sink deep, deep into your soul. Because if God is for us, if God is for us, if God is for us, it's going to be okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the gift of work. And we do pray for those who are looking for work. Please grant them the gift of work, Lord. But we also say thank you today for the gift of rest. And that we get to worship you, not only in our work, but in our rest not only in our rest day, but in our sleep. And we thank you for sleep. Now we know, Lord, for some of us, sleep is just really hard and we really battle with it. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant to your people whom you love deep sleep, refreshing sleep, especially those young mums out there. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us enter into this work-rest rhythm daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Lord, we want to say thank you because you are good and you do not treat us as machines to be exploited and expended. We are not expendable to you. We thank you that you give us space to rest, to refresh and to rejoice in you and to demonstrate our trust in you. Lord, help us. And we know for us, Lord, there are some of us who have got external pressures upon us that we can't control. And we do pray for those dear brothers and sisters who are in those, those seasons right now. But for those of us, Lord, where we do have a choice, we pray, Father, that we will put down our pens and put down our tools and demonstrate 
that you are in charge and that you are for us, that you are the God who can do more in our sleep than we can do in our work. And finally, Lord, for those who have not yet found their rest in Christ, our friends who are with us today, oh, Lord, help them to know that you have done absolutely all the work required for their salvation at the cross, that you bore their sins in your body on that tree, left there at the cross, never to be used against them. Lord, may they find their rest, the rest of their souls in you and you alone. And all the saints said... Amen indeed. If God is for us, and that's the God we're going to praise right now.